friends, I have been discussing aluminum extraction for last four lectures or so. I will end the my lectures by discussing uh, something very specific to Indian aluminum industry. Now, there is a background to um, this and let me explain that. When I was in IIT Kharagpur as a professor, I joined in the year 1980. I floated a course called energy in metallurgical processes. Now, at that time many people did not realize why should there be a course on energy, but now people know that this is a vital subject that energy gives rise to environmental problems. And so that is why eventually I with some other friends of mine I could write a book on energy in metallurgy and mineral industries. Anyway, I have always been interested in the energy aspects and when you talk about aluminum, uh, it is a vital thing that energy requirement in aluminum industry and when you use energy, you necessarily create environmental problems. So, after my retirement from um, Bhubaneswar, uh, when I went to Calcutta, uh, some of I got together with some people I knew. One of them was one Mr. R. N. Parbat, who is the executive director of an aluminum company. We formed a, a society, rather an institution called the Millennium Institute of Energy and Environment Management. Mr. Parbat was the first president. Uh, I was the president last year. Now, somebody else has taken over. Now, we organize many events all aimed at energy and environment related issues. We happened to organize one in the year 19, 2005 on advancements in smelting technologies for aluminum, because aluminum is an energy intensive industry. There were many speakers. I have picked up one paper by somebody who was very critical of what is happening, what is not happening and I will present it without editing. I am not, I am keeping the name of the author because uh, I will make comments which I may or may not agree with this. There are many things mentioned here which I understand, some I do not understand. What I do not understand, I will tell you. What I understand, I will and if there is something I want to add, I would like to add in this lecture. Now, this is the picture of a typical aluminum plant. You see a series of pots, one after another in a long house, pot house. These are the different electrolytic cells, one by one they come. And they are fed from two bus bars on top, they carry current from there, they all tap the current, they all operate under the same voltage. This is a typical view of an uh, aluminum electrolysis plant. Now, I have mentioned it repeatedly that, and let me read it out again here. This process is originated in 1886. In India today, we are consuming something like 15,000 kilowatt hour per ton of aluminum. The best cells in the world operate at about 13 kilowatt hour per ton. So, there are attempts to bring down the figures. Incidentally, please remember this presentation is dated 2005. So, it is already 4 years since then. Not that many things have changed, but still I must mention that. <coughs> it is given typical cell dimension, rectangular steel shell 9.16, 9 to 16, 3 to 4, 1 to 1 1.3 uh, meter high. These are the uh, cell dimensions. These are lined with refractory. Side walls have less insulation and hence more heat is lost. 
and the result is solidification of electrolyte in contact with walls to form a frozen ledge. Let me let me go back to the previous slide once more because I want to mention something. Look at this figure: fifteen thousand kilowatt hour per ton of aluminum metal, which means 1000 kg. So, for per kg of aluminum, you would need 15 kilowatt hour. Now, if one has to pay 3 rupees per kilowatt hour, then per kg of aluminum, you will need 45 rupees simply as cost of power. If it is 4 rupees, it is 60. If it is 2 rupees per unit, it will be 30. So, the cost of electricity that is supplied to the aluminum plant is vital. Now, most aluminum companies want to have their own power plant, so that they can generate power very efficiently. But sometimes, they have to buy from the government, from the grids and for which there has to be uh, protracted discussion with the government. Sometimes, government gives them a subsidy. They give them a special rate, which is lower than which some other industries get, because the government realizes that aluminum in industry has to consume power, and with the power um, cost is more, the industry will become unviable. So, the entire aluminum industry centers around cost of power and per kg of aluminum, if you are using 15 kilowatt hour, the price of electricity becomes vital. Now, the paper mentioned by saying that the world actually wants to see that 100 percent recycling of aluminum is done by 2020. Now, imagine what will happen to the world in a distant future 50 years from now. You will produce all the metals you need, then you need not go on producing more metal. Whatever is there, you have used and discarded, recycle it. So, we can always think of a world where no more primary metal production is there, metals are recycled. This happens to a very large degree for steel in advanced countries. You know, steel goes, more, most of it goes for the automotive industry in America. If you ever go visit America, you will see there are a huge stockyards of old vehicles. So, from there they take out the electronic uh, goods, the tires, etcetera. Then the car bodies, the huge presses come and compact them, huge car becomes uh, uh, 2 feet by 2 feet by 2 feet or 3 feet by 3 feet by 3 feet cube and this scrap goes in for melting. Some 40 percent or 50 percent of iron uh, steel is produced in America by recirculation. The advantage of aluminum in recirculation is suppose you have an aluminum object or an aluminum utensil, you have used it and then you have discarded it, it, it does not get corroded, it stays as it is. Now, to produce aluminum, you do not have to again have go for electrolysis. All you need is bit of cleaning, refining and with much less energy consumption, again you can produce aluminum. So, the aluminum industry is ideal for recirculation of scrap metal, but then 100 percent recirculation will not be possible now, because say in India, as we are advancing, we need more and more aluminum. And so, we have to produce primary aluminum. The world would also, there is a population growth, there is more need for aluminum. So, primary aluminum production will not come to 0, but as more aluminum you produce, more scrap will be available, more circulation should be possible. So, the world aluminum industry wants 100 percent recirculation of aluminum by 2020 and then make up the demand by producing some more aluminum. So, this will close the gap between recycled and primary metal to optimize the value of the metal. 
because the recycled aluminum will cost much less because the energy part will be minimal. Then there are technologies being developed to produce zero beneficial, non-zero beneficial emissions of greenhouse gases. The all kinds of gases, chlorine is one. There are many other things I mentioned. I need not go into detail. In this, he says electrical consumption amounts to about 60 percent of the cost of aluminum. This, of course, depends on where you are doing it. If you are working in Dubai, where the energy costs are very low, this will not be valid. Under Indian conditions, he says 60, some people say 50, some people say 40, because it all depends on the cost at which power is made available. Then technology needs to be developed so that the power consumption target goes down to 11 kilowatt hour for smelting from the present day average of 15 kilowatt hour and some of the best technologies are operating at 13 kilowatt hour. So, the goal will be to bring it down to 11 or so. Then the aluminum industry is also looking at to achieve additional energy consumption target also defined next generation processes that is non bare non error process energy efficient processes to reduce the production cost by 25 percent by 2020. Now, I've indicated there is a process called alkan process, there is a there is a process called alcoa process. Unfortunately, both depend on use of aluminum trichloride, which is a highly reactive solid, very difficult to handle industrially. So, one has to find some other method of uh, producing aluminum or make the uh, whole heroes process more efficient. The R and D thrusts recommended at least by the, the author who has written this article said continued development of weighted and drained cathode technology. This I do not understand very well. I guess it basically means that to have a cathode whose surface will be very efficient in discharge of aluminum ions to give aluminum metal, but I am not very clear. Development of low cost continuous or semi continuous sensors to measure alumina superheat and temperature. This is very important. It says see what is happening in an aluminum cell. From the top you are continuously feeding alumina, from the bottom you are continuously taking out aluminum metal. You want to maintain a constant electrode separation distance between anode and cathode and I mentioned 3 to 5 centimeters. So, ever. so, there is an input, there is an output, how do you control? Now, in the industry today all kinds of sensors available to, to measure levels and whenever there are changes in the level, there are automatic devices which will control feeding rate here, discharge rate here and as I mentioned little while ago that any industrial process is most efficient when it operates under constant conditions, temperature, concentration, electrode separation distance, composition of the electrolyte for all these you need sensors. Sensors which will measure everything and sensors will be connected to automatic uh, devices which will immediately take a correcting action if there is deviation from the level that you want. We also need continuous development of new carbothermic production processes like alkan, explore other novel concepts for producing aluminum that is inert anode and advanced ceramics. This I have made a mention. Conventionally, you have a consumable graphite anode which is getting consumed, taking oxygen and ions reacting with them producing CO2. It has one advantage, it is bringing down the decomposition voltage, but it is leading to consumption of graphite also generation of CO2. If we could think of an electrode that we can afford, aluminum and platinum we cannot afford. So, as I said there are now inert electrodes under development, 
titanium dioxide, where aluminum will get discharged, nothing will happen to the electrode, oxygen will be generated. So, instead of gases that we do not want, we will produce oxygen, which is an industrially highly um, remunerative uh, product. Then develop um, integrated process model to predict metal quality and economic, develop a melting casting plant and furnace for the future. Uh, this I also am not sure what it means. Now, he very rightly emphasizes something that I have discussed, that there are constraints, the, the Hall Heroes process has to work under uh, very strict boundary conditions and one of them is the alumina content. He is plotting here alumina concentration, he has not given the figures, but I can tell you what they are. It will be about say 5 to 8, that is where the resistance of the cell is minimum. He says there is a working resistance band, it must be between this and this, it should not go beyond it cannot go below this because then you are entering the anode effect region. If you go beyond this, then you have the risk of sludge formation that insolubles will come on top. So, in a very narrow band, the narrow band is the working zone say 5 to 8 percent or so. That is where you have the minimum cell resistance and the operational conditions and ideal. Now, here are some things that we do not normally discuss in a classroom, but I think you should have some idea, because after all uh, when you are talking about aluminum, uh, it is more than what is written on the blackboard. Then here are some data about likely market demand pool. If the economy is growing at 6 to 8 percent, the demand of basic industrial input metals, cement, coal etcetera likely to go to 9 to 12 percent. At 9 percent annual demand of growth rate of aluminum, the demand could reach from the present 0 0.7 million tons per annum to 1.1 million tons. In 2005, he predicted our demand will exceed 1.15 million tons. We do not produce that much, we produce only a fraction of that, that is why you have to depend on imports. And by 2015, it may go up to 1.7 million tons. That is the kind of development India is looking at. Now, look at the financial aspects of that. At the present smelter capacity building cost of $5,500 per ton. Now, if you want to bring in a, uh, a smelter, this is how much it cost in capital cost in 2005. So, the investment into aluminum smelter by 2015 could be order, order of 27,000 crores. So, the kind of investment required for expansion of the aluminum industry that we want to see will be 27,000 crores plus correction for inflation, escalation, etcetera and the figure must have doubled by now, because 5 years have gone past. And even today, we do not have an Indian technology. So, National Aluminum Company of Bhubaneswar, they paid 85 rupees 85 crores as fees for a 2440 crore project in 1981, means whenever they are getting a technology that we call top the shelf technology, everything is compact, everything is defined, they give you the technology, this is how you do, you pay fees for it. And for a 2550 uh, crore project, they paid 85 crores. He says in 2005 that India could pay a premium of rupees 950 crore for overseas technologies for just 1 million ton per annum capacity expansion. So, for getting 1 million ton capacity expansion, you end up paying 
950 crores. Suppose you make it a rough figure of 1000. So, if you want increase of 10 million tons, you will pay 10,000 crores. If you want 20 million tons expansion, 20,000 crores. If you want 100 million tons, you will pay 100 million tons crores. And we are only producing about 350 thousand tons, no sorry 1.3 million tons, we want to increase it. So, see amount of uh, the fees we will have to pay for getting the technology and that is what he calls an irony that even if India embarks today to create an India specific aluminum smelting technology, it may not be ready by 2015. He said that in 2005 is 2009s, we still have not started developing an India specific technology. Still today, if you want to establish an aluminum plant, we have to go to France or we have to go to USA, we might have to go to Canada. They supply the technology, they set up the plant, they take fees for it, they take some royalties on the metal produced. It is necessary that metallurgists of this country, engineers of the country come into this area to develop our own technology. China does not do that. China will import once or twice, then they will go ahead and make their own things. All the glass furnaces, all the aluminum plant they set up is by their own design or their own engineers. Why we cannot do it? First of all, we do not have quality manpower. Why we do not have it? Because metallurgy in general, non ferrous metallurgy is no longer a preferred field of study, we all know it. We do not, we need to create an adequate quality manpower pool, it is still not a national priority. We do not have that kind of planning in our country. In countries like America, Russia, they plan centrally that we want so many engineers in this area, this is how we proceed. It will interest you to know that the uh, steel ministry set up about two years ago a body to look at the needs in educational institutions that will guarantee manpower for the expanding steel industry. Steel industry has this problem, uh, steel industry is expanding, it is today 56, 57 million tons per year, they want to go to 100 million tons very soon. Where are the engineers? Our metallurgical engineers you know they go for uh, the IT sector, they go abroad, they go for research, they are not getting uh, metallurgists and in many metallurgy departments, they hardly teach ferrous metallurgy. They are teaching material science, they are teaching other subjects which are important, I am not saying they are not important. So, the committee finally recorded, they made an analysis and said that we need how many students metallurgy graduates will be required simply for for to meet the demand of the steel plants and then they found there are no teachers so now steel ministry has given a directive and given funds that every metallurgy department will have a steel chair professor there will be somebody in the area of ferrous metallurgy to talk about steel production we do not have that in the area of non ferrous metallurgy yet and in many metallurgy departments if steel is taught non ferrous metallurgy still gets a, uh, a secondary importance. We need to bring metallurgy students and they should not think that non ferrous metallurgy is something which is dirty job, you are running around in mines or running around the plant, it can be as sophisticated as any and there is a tremendous need for metallurgists in non ferrous sector. He lamented that the industry and national planners are yet to accept that there is anything wrong with this system. The first stage of correction is still missing, that we have not accepted the problem. Now, he talked about Hindalco, which is the largest integrated aluminum plant and you know on the right hand corner we have the Hindalco's Aditya Bila company's logo. They own bauxite mines, refinery, their power comes from cogeneration facilities. By the word cogeneration, it means 
the thermal power plant generates power as well as steam because steam goes for uh, the leaching. So, its cogeneration means electrical power as well as steam. They have a joint venture caustic soda plant, they have an aluminum smelter, they have a power plant which supplies power, there is an aluminum fluoride plant they own, it is again joint venture. Then after they have produced aluminum, they have a fabrication plant, rolling mills, foils they produce, they produce rods of various kinds, there are extrusion processes, they produce alloy wheels. So, the plant not only produces metal, but they also produce products and these are called downstream processes. After you have produced the metal, when you, the metal goes to produce uh, various products for the uh, industry, that is called downstream processing. Here the word M does not mean million, please remember it is called metric. In the industry, the capital M always means metric term. It is not necessary anymore really, uh, because at one time we had this problems with uh, uh, pound tons, 2240, uh, 2000, etcetera, etcetera. The metric terms, 1000 kg. See how the smelting capacity has gone up in our country, in Hindalco. In, in, it, it just it keeps on going. Production share of various companies is shown here today. There is Hindalco. I am sure it is not very clear. Hindalco is 39 percent, Nalco is 36 percent, Sterlite. Sterlite is what Balco used to be, now they have been taken over Sterlite, Indal 8 percent. Indal is uh, near Calcutta. So, these are the main companies, there may be one or two small ones and the market share Sterlite 16 percent, then Nalco 25 percent, Hindalco 25 percent, Indal 1 percent, imports 26 percent. We are importing mm, to meet the market demand. Now, dimensions of the future growth. The dimension they say is it has to go up to 360,000 tons per annum, means 0.36 million ton. Alumina has to grow and the rolling capacity has to go, the optimization of power resources, acquisition of other alumina facilities in, in the country and overseas, the exploration of possibilities put up greenfield plant based on east coast bauxite. This is what I discussed a little while ago. In the east coast, like Orissa and Andhra Pradesh, a lot of coastal bauxite. How do you put up greenfield plant based there? That struggle is going on. Now, the cost of aluminum production in Hidalgo, 7 power manpower, stores another thing 6 percent, power 40 percent, aluminum production is 40 percent bath materials carbon 13 percent, alumina 33 percent. So, both Bayer's process and the whole rose process are consuming a lot of energy. He gave an empirical equation for the um, energy consumption that if the current efficiency is high, if the pot voltage is low then the energy consumption will come down, it is understandable. The energy consumption figures for Hindalco is like this. From 2003, they were somewhere here, they have gradually managed to come down to this figure 13.89 kilowatt hour per ton of aluminum, 0 0.4 it must have gone down further now. There is also attempt to bring down pot voltage. You know this pot voltage is a summation of decomposition voltage over potential electronic circuit resistance that causes voltage drop, then the resistance of the electrodes themselves. So, there are and of course, the resistance of the bath. There is scope for reduction in voltage in all these, and I have been discussing that. So, in the industry, has been trying 
and they have been able to bring down the total pot voltage to 4.388. So, it is around 4.2, 4.3 as of now. Industry is very sensitive about uh, the financial implications of this and there are some figures here uh, which you should uh, note. If they can bring down the pot voltage per pot by only about 0.1 volt, they can save energy to the tune of 348 kilowatt hour per ton of aluminum. Monetary gains per annum would be 1766 lakh. So, if even in a small amount of drop in energy consumption will bring them so much of financial benefit. Other financial gains, total power saved per annum, so many units, additional production. If you can, if you are using less energy, then you can say with the energy you are using earlier, you can have additional production. So, that also is taken into monetary benefit calculation. They say the total annualized benefits will be so much. 4425 lakhs per annum simply by reduction of pot voltage by 1.1 volt. Their technology is supplied by Alcan, it is a horizontal stud Soderberg HSS, there the anode is not vertical, it comes horizontal stud, line current is this, these are the um, sizes of the anode, anode current density. the average life um, of the lining 2, 3, 8, 3 days means after every uh, so many days a pot has to be closed down and the lining has to be changed. What are the challenges for the aluminum industry? A couple of challenges should become very obvious to you now that first challenge is reduction in consumption of uh, energy and carbon. Then we have uh, indigenous technologies that is uh, that we want and we want lot of mathematical modeling people to tell us how do you optimize the entire process voltage, current, cathode distance, cathode anode separation, the composition of the electrolyte, temperature. So, in one does not do experiments anymore. I mean you cannot experiment with an aluminum electrolytic cell to see what will happen if we do this or if we do that. Now, these are done in virtual cells in through mathematical modeling. People have developed equations to describe the cell behavior in terms of the process parameter using mathematical equations. This is where maximum amount of R and D is going on. That is what you want to do in mathematical modeling and predict that if this happens, then that happens. If you want to optimize, this is what you should do. And at best by doing that, you can see by whether they are correct. So, in a cell, you can do some mathematical modeling and then validate them. When you are sure that okay, what your predictions are, you have confidence, you can tell to an industry, please try this out and they see whether this is valid. But an industry will not do heat and trial experiment to study what happens if this goes up, if the, what happens if this goes down. But they are willing to try something recommended to them if they have confidence uh, in the modelers. And this work is done today extensively in Jawaharlal Nehru Research Development Design Center at Nagpur. There is a group which does mathematical modeling. They do things, they go with their uh, package to Nalco and Nalco tries them out. Reduction in environmental impacts, lot of work going on increasing per capita consumption. Now, this is a very interesting thing. The aluminum industry wants to increase demand in the country because they say that if there is demand then there will be pressure 
on the government to help the uh, aluminum industry produce more? It is this question that suppose you produce a whole lot of cars, then you improve the roads. It never, it is never like this that you first improve the roads because you know cars are coming. Things happen because of pressure. If there are a lot of cars on the road, then the roads will be improved, then flyovers will be built. So, the aluminum industry very typically also aims like that. They want to increase the demand among the public, bring in products, bring in, uh, show them possibilities of using an aluminum, so that people want more and more aluminum. Then the companies produce more and more aluminum, then government has to find how they to produce more and more aluminum. One fantastic uh, area in which that aluminum can be used in large quantities in silos in rural sector for storage of grain or vegetables or agricultural produce. Perhaps you know in the rural sector, so, so about 30 percent of agricultural produce are destroyed by pests, insects, birds, rats, because we do not have storage facility. People can think of storage facility in terms of steel, but then they would be subject to corrosion. So, the aluminum industry and steel industry, they are trying to develop for use storage facilities, bins in all for the rural sector where in every village there will be say 20 feet, 30 feet tall uh, containers from where you can feed that you want to store will be fitted from the top. There will be a device to take out things from the bottom. They can be made double walled so that the temperature fluctuations the in, in hot weather it will not be so hot inside. There are all kinds of things are being thought of. This could be one way of creating big demand for aluminum use of aluminum in the building industry, in transport industry, they are all coming up. For that we might have to develop new kind of aluminum alloys which are attractive. But the industry is also working very consciously in developing avenues for increase in per capita consumption. Then the demand will increase, we want more and more of this. Then there will be a case for more aluminum production, no matter what, then the government has to support. There is also emphasis on recycling, whatever aluminum you get that is there discarded or the scrap recycle. And we need lot of R and D in all these areas. So, the aluminum industry actually is poised for a big growth. I have already indicated the contrary requirements that there are contradictions, you want to do something, but there are other problems. Now, the way the planners work is that when they plan, they visualize what are the problems that their plans can lead to. So, they have to start working on those problems also. Things must go in parallel. Say for example, you want to plan uh, an aluminum industry in an area. You have to do couple of things together. First of all, not only survey the area, look for investors, you have to start talking to the people there, that if the land is to be taken, in discussions with those people are necessary. A settlement is necessary on social issues. This cannot happen in sequence, like first an industry comes, and the industry people go there to survey and the local people are up in arms, why are you here? They do not know this project has not been discussed with them. So, then, then you run around to find out the solution, this will not work. They have to be done in sequence. And when an industry is planned, industry not only wants to produce aluminum and alumina, they have to find where alumina will go, where aluminum will go, they have to plan not only to produce the metal they have to think of downstream processes. There are some intermediate products and there are some consumer applications. Consumer applications of aluminum are infinite and even thinking of newer applications need research and development. 
people have found applications where nobody realized that there could be applications. Foils, for example, aluminum foils that are used in kitchens today. You want to roast something chicken, you put aluminum foil and do the baking or do the roasting. These sort of things were not thought of earlier because people did not know that you can develop an alloy which can be rolled to a thickness, a thinness of that kind. People do not know that there are very special requirements of aluminum uh, foils and many other things for the army and the defense people because of packages of food for, uh, for in, in all kinds of containers and vessels. So, the, the demand uh, and, the, and the variety of aluminum products are infinite. I think in India, aluminum industry can have as bright a future as steel industry. There is a special reason why these things are coming more towards our side. If you go to the developed world, you will find extraction processes there are no longer what they used to do, because all metal extraction processes are have environmental problems. Now, those countries now want to pass off these environmental problem creating industries to the developing world. They have gone to higher technologies, they have gone to uh, sophisticated industries, sophisticated products, electronics and so at one time America used to be a leader in steel production, it is no longer a leader. Now, steel production is mainly in China, South Korea. India, Japan, it is no longer in UK or America. They have got rid of their processing industries. Of course, there is aluminum now, as I said aluminum is produced in Canada, in America in large quantity, but then slowly we will have to take over these things, but then, then there are again constraints, aluminum needs power as I have discussed, we have to find solutions to that. There is no alternative today than to use either thermal power plants or the hydel powers we have. We cannot use in the foreseeable future any other source of energy to feed the aluminum industry. Okay, friends, that is all I have to say uh, for this module. Uh, so far as aluminum is concerned. I still am not done with extraction of metals from oxides. I will continue this subject because there are many other metals which come from oxides. Uh, I will go into production of tin, production of ferroalloys which all are come from oxide sources. And for every metal or every ferroalloy that we discuss, there is a, a specific Mm, uh, peculiarity. It can never be the same process applicable everywhere. It may look the same, but it is not the same. And uh, <coughs> when I discuss next the uh, production of tin, uh, this will become very clear to you. We, I will take two more lectures uh, to finish this module 5, which is about extraction of metals from oxides. And then I will move on to extraction of metals from sulphides. That would also need uh, several lectures because under metals from sulphides will come many metals copper, lead, zinc, nickel also. Then beyond that, I will come to metals from halides, not necessarily naturally occurring halides that halides made from oxide sources. So, there is a lot more in this course. I have been touching energy and environmental issues now and then, but this I will consolidate towards the end. I will take two or three lectures only to discuss energy and environment related issues. I have often strayed into social issues 
have talked about social problems. One could discuss that in great detail, but that I will not do. Excepting I will mention something in the passing. There is today a, a word, rather a phrase called corporate social responsibility, CSR. It is a buzzword and it is an internationally recognized term. The word corporate social responsibility means that if there is an industry, then the industry can legitimately work for profit, financial gain, but they are also morally and legally bound to look after the welfare of the people in their company and the people in the region locally. So, United Nations have discussed this subject and they will be given some 8 or 9 points. They are not mandatory, they are guidelines as to what should the industry do under this corporate social responsibility. And all big industries are now beginning to take it very seriously. Like in at one time people used to think if you spend on environmental protection, then a company has to spend on ways of environmental protection and so the would be less profitable. But now people have realized that is a wrong concept. If you take measures for environmental protections, then eventually you gain. How do you gain? If you do things that are necessary for environmental protection, your image goes up, your people who work are happy. If they are happy, their, their efficiency goes up. Like if a laborer, if he is working under a polluting environment, not only he is not able to do function very well, he may fall ill and then you may be required to look after him, uh, take care of the medical expenses. So, making the environment more human friendly, the company eventually gains. And there has been a revolutionary changes in the last 20 years or so. As a student, I remember I used to go to Jamshedpur, take training in many of the companies. The place was filthy and dirty. The, even in the city, you could see fumes, you could see dust and dirt. But now you go to Jamshedpur, they have planted thousands and maybe millions of trees all around. The whole city now begins to look like a garden. Inside factories, they have also taken environmental protection measures. They have spent huge amounts of money, but on the whole, they have come out more profitable. Similarly, people used to think that corporate social responsibility, which suggests certain measures they do for the welfare of the community, would only mean uh, expenditure. But I will discuss that is not so. Eventually, they stand to gain. What will be the activities under corporate social responsibility? There are eight and nine of them, and I will discuss them very uh, systematically at the end. But just to hint, there are from the United Nations guidelines like this education for the girl child, something about diseases like AIDS. This sort of thing should become uh, a priority projects with some industries, they have to work for the people all around. So, an industry today is simply not a technology which churns out metals and churns out um, something discarded, it is much more. We will discuss that. So, then let me wind up uh, what has been discussed so far under module 5. We started by discussion, discussing extraction of magnesium. 
it was not a very complicated thing. Magnesium oxide is obtained from magnesite by calcination or MgOCO can be obtained by calcination from dolomite, we reduce by carbon at temperature around 1000 degrees. It is not feasible thermodynamically, can be made feasible by application of vacuum. There is a very clean collection of magnesium because magnesium vapor comes out, you condense, you get magnesium. It is simple. It is the mechanism of the reaction which is very important. It is not solid solid reaction because once you have, sorry, you are not reducing by carbon you are reducing by ferrosilicon and once ferrosilicon starts reacting, it reduces some calcium, you produce a ternary alloy which permeates the entire briquette and then the reaction is speeded up. Then I have spent some um, five lectures on aluminum and I have discussed in detail the useful properties of aluminum, I have discussed Bayer's process for production of pure alumina from uh, bauxite. Then I have discussed hall heroes process for electrolysis of alumina dissolved in cryolite. I did, I mentioned that cryolite needs many, many additives also, many other additives to modify the properties, melting point, density, surface tension, viscosity. Solubility of L2 or 3 in it, this and that. And with all that, every company comes up with its own formula as to what to add, what not to add. And then there are many process parameters that have to be optimized temperature, distance between anode and cathode, composition of the electrolyte, etcetera, etcetera because we need to optimize things and we need to control things to minimize energy consumption, graphite consumption in anode, increase current efficiency and to keep things going in the most efficient manner, we need very accurate measurements and accurate control. These are done by sensors and feedback devices and to aid all this today, a tremendous use is made of mathematical modeling which predicts as to what will happen if things are changed in a certain way. So, nobody does in the industry hit and trial experiments. In research laboratories, mathematical models are developed to predict outcome of operation under certain conditions. The industry, if it accepts that as best, tries to see whether that is valid. So, they validate the model. If they validate the model, then they accept that model. I have talked about three layer process for electro refining of aluminum and I have said that two processes have been tried out as alternate to all arrows process. One is electric furnace smelting of alumina to produce aluminum that contains iron, carbon, silicon, etcetera to get from that by reaction with aluminum trichloride, aluminum monochloride and decomposing that get pure aluminum or get pure alumina chlorinated to produce aluminum trichloride and then go for that alqua process which aimed at dissolving aluminum trichloride about 5 percent in sodium chloride, potassium chloride, electrolyte. Electrolysis uh, will take place at a lower temperature no carbon consumption will be there and it will generate chlorine which will go for chlorination of L2O3. Unfortunately, none of these processes worked out very well. Now, at the end, I presented to you in a nutshell a paper that was presented by a man from the industry and just to share uh, the, and the, the way an industry person looks at things and it is not always the same the way an academic looks at it. Of course, they are always looking at it from financial angle. So, that is why I mentioned some financial figures. Thank you very much.